Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. This is Austin Linney. We're taking this round two, the ice storm, and Austin tried to get us, but we're back. I got the couple, uh, Nate Smith and his lovely wife. How are y'all doing today? Doing fantastic. Great. Great. Thanks for having us on, Austin. Yep. It's a pleasure to have y'all on. I appreciate y'all having uh, patience with me on this one. Guys, before we get started, I want to thank uh, DreamChasers.com, our uh, sponsor for the podcast. Thank you so much, Mr. Adam Carswell. What I want to do with y'all, because y'all do so many things, I want you to each individually uh, introduce yourself and kind of tell everybody what they what y'all handle, and then we'll kind of go from there so uh, everybody can kind of see what what's going on over there. Okay, perfect. So um, my name is Nate. It's my wife, Bethany. Uh, my background has been in the Air Force. I spent 13 years in the Air Force, still serve part-time in the Air National Guard out here in California as a pilot. Um, then also we have a, a financial services business. A big focus there is just financial literacy, helping people understand how money really works, putting them back in the driver's seat of their finances, and then helping with strategies and solutions um, to help them get from where they are to where they want to be. So that's a big part of our, our focus. We also have a real estate investing background, uh, both my wife and I. My wife is primarily focused on that side of so let her tell you more about that aspect of our lives but uh, we've been investing uh, we got started investing a little bit right out of the gate when i first joined the military used a va loan house hacked a uh, house and then um through different networks we found got ourselves in the multifamily. but uh that's a little my background kind of where i came from i'll let bethany tell you about the real estate side of things so that's her her main focus yeah so um as nate mentioned we're been a military couple uh we've been married about 11 years and uh i started out uh, working in education, I transitioned um, with uh, after five or six years into real estate. Thought initially I want to be a realtor. Um, found out after working in that space, did not want to be a realtor, um, but uh, got to really fall in love with uh, commercial, specifically apartment investing. Um, through that experience, um, our team serviced a lot of investor clients that were buying smaller multifamily properties, and I saw. Um, you know, the returns they were making. And I just really enjoyed their thought process and whatnot, enjoyed working with them. So beginning of 2019, took the leap and uh, started an, on that uh, new journey full time, quit my job and uh, just kind of went in full bore. So um, and then as Nate mentioned, we have a financial services company. Um, I do primarily help him with that. And then uh, and then but then the investing and multifamily business is uh, primarily my baby when I what I focus on. And Nate's um, super supportive and, and helps me out with that as much as he can, but uh, it's primarily my focus. Yeah, and then as a couple, we call ourselves your cash flow couple. Our mission there is just all around financial literacy, helping people um, get a better position with their finances, and also just inspiring other other couples to um, you know figure out how to you know, work, figuring out how to work together, mm -hmm. do life together, build businesses together, uh, things like that. So. It's like you set me up because that's where I was gonna go. First, we're gonna go. We're gonna go here because when I work private equity, like you know, that for me was kind of my crash course in money. And you know, it helps to have an advisor who manages a bunch of money, which half the time he's talking, I have no idea what the hell he's talking about. Uh, it sounds like Rain Man stuff, but. And that kind of made me realize how much the the general public does not even like understand where money comes from. It doesn't even understand how it works. But more importantly, what scares me even more is as I go out and help people, because I, I am a recovering, whatever, alcoholic, drug addict, as I we have charities that go and help people in entrepreneurship, what scares me even more is the, the plight in the poverty-stricken communities where they don't even know how to get a loan. They don't even yeah. know how a credit card works. And that... Like, I was like, oh, no, no, this is not good. And so my, I'm curious your thoughts on it. Is it, is it, they don't even understand it or is a lack of even understanding that it's even available? I think it's uh, definitely both. Uh, society has rigged it against us. Um, you know, the banks, Wall Street, they, they have specific things they want us to do with our money. And it's very different than what they end up doing with our money. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just a lack of basic understanding of how investing works. 
Um, a lot of people invest their 401k at work, but they have no idea what share classes are in, what fees expenses are paying. They just pick a fund because it has a fancy name or something like that. Um, sit down with clients all the time that, you know, I ask them those questions. They're like, what are you talking about? Uh, this is a retirement account. I'm supposed to be there when I retire. Um, basically things like that, you know, credit, people don't understand credit loans. Like it's funny, all the things that we are taught in school, we get out into the real world, all, you know, none of that stuff is applicable as is applicable. All the things that we really need is like with financial literacy, like you said, how to get a loan, how to use, how to use a credit card the correct way. Cause they're all tools. It's just a matter of how to use a tool correctly. Cause if you don't use it correctly, it can get you in a lot of trouble, which a lot of people find themselves in. hundred percent. And it's, so it's, so when you understand the mechanism of money per se, like, like just had somebody text me and they're like, we need to raise 2 million for a deal. And like, I'm like, okay, sounds good. Like, and so like, he's like, who's going to help us. I was like, I know some people, but I guess it's cause I've been in that space for so long that like, I guess you understand that here's an asset, right? Just let's, let's break it down as simple as possible. There's an asset that you give money to, and you yeah. put debt on top of it, and then that creates cash flow on the other side to pay off the debt, right? Yeah. And something as simple as that, when you can wrap your head around it, then you can buy, like y'all do, you can buy apartment complexes maybe in a city that you don't live in because you understand that the deal yep. is the true mechanism that makes the money go round and round and round, right? Yep, exactly. And yep. we all of our investments are not in the markets that we live in, so... Mm-hmm. All of everything we bought has been out, you know, out of state from where we're we're located in California, and um, yeah, it's exactly it. It's just you know understanding that the mechanism of a deal, how a deal works, um, understanding the different types of investments that are available out there. A lot of people just think the only thing they can invest in is their an IRA or four hundred one k, but you know, understanding that the wealthy don't invest in those vehicles, um, partly because they can't, because they make too much, and partly because they know there's better options out there available to them, and so. Um, yeah, just across the board, just understanding all those different mechanisms and how they actually work is, is where a lot of people come up short. Mm-hmm. So if, if somebody is wanting to learn more or somebody's getting into this space, what are the, where are the avenues to learn this stuff? How do you learn this stuff? Is it YouTube? Is it, is there books that you suggest? Yeah, I mean, definitely there's some good books out there. Um, we have a book called the How Money Works book that's on our platform that we we recommend for folks giving the basics. Um, I have a course I've put out that kind of goes through seven money milestones uh, to kind of build that foundation. Um, YouTube, for sure, there's good resources there. You know, one of the first books we read to kind of get us in that mindset, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki, that's a classic a lot of people start with. Um, I know Tony Robbins got some good books. You know, a lot of it, unfortunately, you do have to take it on your own self to go learn this stuff. It's not, like I said, it's not really taught in schools anywhere. Um, very few, you know, in the colleges, high schools that do offer finance classes, usually it's very basic stuff, not, um, you know, actual mindset and mechanisms behind how money works. So those are a couple of resources that, that you can look at um, for sure to get started. In the website, he mentioned seven mile, uh, seven money milestones. If you go there and complete the course, yeah. um, we, we put that together and, Yep. So that's a great What's funny start. enough, before we got started, I was looking through those websites in this book and uh, I, I love the, the the way this book is put together. I actually asked for a copy, but more importantly, uh, we just went through our first six people who were from, you know, had out of rehab and we're teaching them entrepreneurship and real estate. So I'm going to make this, I'm going to buy this for every group moving forward. Like I nice. want to give this to them because it's such a, it's amazing when they understand like, right. For example, I'll use a girl that, that works, that's in the group. She crochets mm-hmm. stuff. And like, she's been a house mom and she's sober now. And I was like, how much is that blanket? And she's like, well, it's like 150 bucks. And I was like, Oh damn. I was, she's, I was like, okay. So start an Etsy shop and start selling them. And she was like, I can do that. And I was like, yeah, just like that. And she goes, yeah have a business. And I was like, yeah. And now you have a business that you can create money that you can go then buy real estate and then yeah. retire. And she was like, Oh shit, this is awesome. <laughs> you know, and so like, it's yeah. crazy the what's available out there in the world when you're handed the right tools around the right set of people. And I think I, something I admire about y'all is I see who you hang around. I see the conversations you're having. I see the groups that you're in that you're, that you're a part of. And I would imagine that your network and who you work with and, and talk to on a daily basis really affects, you know, the level that you've been able to obtain. Absolutely. I mean, environment, 100%. yeah, environment network is everything. Um, you know, I didn't definitely didn't come from that environment. You know, I come from a very middle-class family, a military, back, my whole life was military. So didn't really, wasn't surrounded with some of those, those people, but I learned very early on the importance of 
surrounding yourself with the people that are where you want to be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I looked at if, when the career path I was going on, I looked 10, 15 years down the road. I'm like, is that where I want to be? No, not really. So I need to go find the people that are where I want to be in, you know, five, 10, 15 years and start getting in those, those networks and those groups. And it definitely, it's a mindset, you know, it's changing the mindset, the belief level. Like when we first got an apartment investing initially it was like, Oh, this is, this is, this is like, this is huge. Like, you know, mind boggling. I like, try to wrap my head around how it all works. Then you go sit down with somebody, at, you know, over, over a meal. And they're talking about the 4,000 units that they own. Like it's, it's nothing. And you're like, Oh, it's not as complicated as I thought. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, it's the truth because what I found, and I don't mean this as a slight to anybody because I love the vehicle of real estate. I do. And I'm in it and we're about to launch a construction company, you know, the whole thing. Right. But when you start talking on podcasts, you start talking to business people. You're like, dude, there's so many more businesses out there. Like I enjoy just business in general and like real estate is part of a thing. And my only complaint if anybody's listening, I apologize. My only complaint with the real estate community is they're a little caught in their own world. Like, and I'm not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying to me, you only viewing real estate as your vehicle is also small minded thinking too. Sure. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's a big reason why we started our financial services company because, um, you know, real estate for us, we kind of quickly realized this is going to be more of a long-term wealth creation play. You know, of course your objective is to be getting, you know, cash flow from assets and whatnot, but big picture is it's going to take a little while to build up to the level that you want to be at, you know, and, and retire yourself and all this sort of stuff. Um, and so we were looking for, you know, a, a, a cash flow generating vehicle that yes, we could yes. then put into real estate. Yep. So I think those two things, and that's, that's a mentor, you know, a mentor of ours in real estate has that exact same type of model. And so, you know, that's really what we, what we wanted to, um, implement so yeah. that we kind of cover the best of both worlds, if you will. Yeah. yeah. yeah one of the. Yeah. One of the first people that I, I follow kind of got the mindset behind this was Grant Cardone. He, you know, he has his main main business that produces the income, and then it all flows into real estate. And so that was kind of the the idea that I had looking for our our business to be able to cash flow to fund real estate. So we ran our first mastermind back in November in Austin, uh, Construct Your Life Mastermind, and we had like six different speakers, all different multi-family sectors, business sectors. And my assistant came and he's new to real estate and investing. I was like, so sum it up. Like, what's your thoughts? This is what he said. Get a job that pays you well, make as much money as you can, invest in real estate and retire early. I was like, there you go. You're done. That's it. Right. But here's the thing is that there's a, there's a neck, there's, there's real estate that's taught to everybody, which whether that be wholesaling or flipping that comes in big chunks over long periods of time. Exactly. I believe to, tr- I believe to truly feel firm and substantial, you need something creating capital monthly to, yes. to cover your bills and then use the excess. Right. I always tell my coaching clients, you need to treat your money like your pops of cash, like, like the football players do where they spend their endorsement or they live off their paycheck and then and the endorsement goes into investment vehicles. Like create those mechanisms where you push the money to the side and technically it's not even yours. And that money mm-hmm. is invested multiple times over to create mm-hmm. um, long-term wealth where you wake up 10 years from now and you're like, okay, like, wow, we've got a lot of money, right? And so what we've done in our business with my financial advisor is we've created siphons off the business when when profit comes in that gets reinvested and then that gets reinvested in long-term wealth and so that money gets multiplied like three or four times before you even touch it and that's where you yeah. can really start creating wealth yeah that's that's a huge point you just made with, with as a business owner doing that i mean so many business owners uh, you know, are failing today because they aren't doing that with their money they're not siphoning off you know taking small chunks and paying themselves and putting that capital cash out that cash uh, cash flow to the side to be able to protect themselves you know when things like 2020 happens and um so that's that's a big area of uh, we like to focus on as well when we're working with clients especially the business owners is tell t- you know explain the importance of having cash reserves and knowing where to put those cash reserves to be able to you know sustain them if something happens so I try to do it in the most elementary way that I can get people to understand it because I've been explained to it by one of the best in the country, my financial advisor. But if you could explain to, let's say, the, the real estate investor or the regular person 
the, the life insurance infinite banking strategy that I probably say about 50 times a day. If people aren't doing it, I don't know what you're doing. So in right. the best way that you can explain it to them, how would, how would you go about explaining to them? That's what I explain is I say you're leveraging high cash rate life insurance. If it's structured and designed properly, basically you're getting the, the benefits of a Roth IRA with the liquidity of a savings account at the bank. And you get leverage and the ability to be able to have your money continue to earn a rate of return, even while you're using it for other investments. Mm, okay. I love that. And so now we're going to make a pivot. We're going to talk to the, the apartment lady and talk about how this works for you, you know, going down what I've never understood. And it's like, there's a couple mysteries in the world. Um, there's a couple monopolies, one of them being cell phone companies, the other one being college bookstores. Um, <laughs> they're just straight up gangsters. I've never met anything like it in my entire life. But I, what the, there's, another, there's another thing out there I don't understand is why more agents aren't investors. Mm. I, I, you're, you're seeing the business over and over again. So you were headed down that path a little bit and you're like, no, 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 no. That's, that's small mind thinking. So what got you into apartments? What, what, what kind of, did, did you start? I know you said you had the, the house hack that you bought, but did, did you ever do any flipping or was it straight into apartments? No, never did any flipping. I mean, the, the first, our primary residence that we bought 11 years ago, we house hacked and essentially flipped it. We did a lot of renovation and, and sold it, but, um, but no, not like not in as short a time frame as a traditional flip is done. Um, so no, I, I, yeah, that's really interesting because I don't understand why more agents and brokers aren't in investing. I don't know mm -hmm. if it's because of the large payoffs that can come from a closing on a flip or wholesale, you know, just the kind of that larger paycheck or real estate commission. But, you know, for whatever reason, they just don't really get into it. I think maybe a, a big piece of that is the mindset. Um, you know, when you're you're going into a new industry or, you know, branching into something new, there's that little voice in the back of your head that says, can you really do this? You really think you can tackle this and understand it and be that type of person. And then there's the uphill learning curve where you're having to learn new information and implement it, you know, and execute in a short, in a short time frame. So I think for me, that's why it was very important for me to quit my job. I'm not saying that's the best thing for, you know, everyone getting into this space to do, but I needed that kind of clear, like burn the ships type action to be able to pour myself into a new, you know, a new, a new industry and a whole new network of people and just like be able to devote myself to that a hundred percent. Luckily for us, you know, my husband was able to, you know, and through our other, um, through our current investments we had, I was able to do that. But, um, yeah, I think it's, I think in large part it's, it's mindset issue. And when I talk to people that are still in that space that I used to work with, um, you know, they, they, they are interested in it. They're intrigued by it. They think it's great, you know, what we're doing, but they're just like, wow, that's, you know, impressive. And like me looking back, I'm just like, it's not impressive. I just did work that nobody else wanted to do, you know, really um, to get started or just took a lot more action in a short period of time. Um, but yeah, they just don't, you know, don't, don't transition into that side of things. So I'm not hundred percent sure why, but that's my, my inkling. So what was the first uh, multifamily asset that you bought uh, when you when you bought your first one? Uh, so we had basically house hacked uh, a, uh, what would you call it? A vacation rental of sorts, uh, corporate housing type setup in Arkansas. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's very much a niche product, but it rents out by the door. So it essentially operates like a, a fourplex. Mm -hmm. um, with a shorter lease term, it's usually about a six month lease term. So that was where we first really started seeing the power of having multiple doors where before, you know, the single family home that we'd house hack, when that's, when that thing's empty, it's hundred percent empty. Yeah. You're having to come up with hundred percent of the mortgage and expenses. Whereas, you know, this asset that we bought um, several years ago, we, we saw that, okay, if one tenant's gone, we're still 75% occupied, you know, we're still mm -hmm. able to cover the mortgage. We're still able to cover the mortgage even with one tenant. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that really opened our eyes to, oh, wow, this more doors thing makes a lot of sense. Um, how do we get into this? You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, yeah, those those asset classes, I know there's a lot of people that have had specialty with them, especially around colleges or stuff like that. It scares me a lot 
Cause it's, yeah. you know, I, Airbnb's already wounded me on another, on a whole other levels and we still do it. But for anybody that has an asset, let's say it's near a military base or near a college, which I've, I've heard it works best. What, what, you know, you're taking an asset that maybe rents for like, what you'd probably like, let's just say 1200 bucks. And then that typical asset, you're probably getting what, six, 700 bucks a door. So, I mean, you're almost in essence doubling, I guess you would say. So mm-hmm. what, what are the, what are the drawbacks to that? Are, are there, if there are any, or, or, or do you see that as a viable way to get started in the real estate investing space? Well, um, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a viable Airbnb, maybe well, what we did, I would say it's too much of a niche product uh, to be like, you could just do it anywhere. Like it, at our property, it ha- it's at a, it's at a base that has a lot of temporary military folks flowing through that base on, on a short term scale, a short term period. So they're there for five to six months and then they're moving on to their, their primary base. So it's a training base. Um, so it works really well in that scenario. I would say the biggest you know, and for us too, you know, having the military connection, you, you know, if I'm, I'm not worried about people messing up my property, yeah. um, you know, and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's pretty safe. If I, I would, I don't know if I would ever do anything to, with college, especially on an Airbnb type scenario, but um, I, mean, I know tons of people making good money with it. I like, I like the model a lot, especially if it's kind of that, and I, I like it ours where people are there for at least three to five months. So okay. it's not like I'm turning over units every week. Or there, no one's coming in for like a, a two or three days at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, if I was doing Airbnb where I was having, you know, right, people could come in for like a week and I'm turning it every single week, that could get pretty, mm-hmm. you know, maybe challenging because you got a lot more stuff to manage. But um, it, but yeah, as a niche it, product, we did it at one time. We were, it was, timing was right. We were, at, I was stationed at the base at the time and it just, I was, I lived in one for six months prior to that and it just made sense. We understood it really well and it kind of fell in our lap, but. Now we're exclusively doing apartments and multi in that site and larger multifamily. And I would add that, you know, anything that's a short term rental contract is more speculative yeah. because short term stuff isn't essential, right? Like people are always mm-hmm. going to need a place to live yep. and they're usually going to need a place to live for a long amount of time, like yeah. six months at a minimum, but usually at least a, a year or longer. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, for us focusing on the traditional apartment model where people are signing a year lease, they have families, you know, they're, they're, they've got jobs in the area and all that sort of thing um, was definitely the more sensible focus for us. Um, I, I, from, and from what I see, it's more so, you know, the more savvy, experienced investors that are doing student mm-hmm. housing or that's like all they do. Yeah. I'm not really yeah. seeing you know, many people get or short-term housing, I should say, you know, corporate, corporate housing, Airbnbs, all that sort of thing. And I think we definitely saw that during COVID where, whether it was students, even the military, you know, cause military mm-hmm. can shut down different operations at different times, depending on mm-hmm. what's going on in, mm-hmm. in the world. Um, you know, uh, vacation rentals, we, we saw those plummet. I haven't really seen stats for, you know, how much, but just from what I know in my network, um, that, that short-term type, uh, lease scenario definitely suffered a little bit during COVID. Yeah, I can tell you the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you the numbers. We got we got lucky. We got real lucky. So we were good. We were about to scale up, and we actually changed our model. So it's actually works for us. But I know mm. there's some people that that really hurt. <laughs> that, that went from making like two fifty a month to zero. So, um, so yeah, big, big deal. So you rented the, by the door, you said, man, we're making some money from this. This is way better than a single asset. And then what was the first, uh, multifamily deal that y'all, uh, decided to buy? Yeah. So, uh, apartment complex in Southern Arizona. Um, so C-class property, 36 units. And, uh, so that was culmination of efforts made in, as I mentioned, I quit my job at the end of 2019. So beginning fresh in 2019, I was just like, all right, I'm all in this multifamily, uh, new learning curve space. Um, Nate was full-time uh, military duty at the time, and he deployed for a good majority of that year. So I was really kind of, you know, footloose and fancy free. We don't have kids to, to you know, travel, go to all these networking events, visit um, target market. Um, multiple times. I think I counted 10 or 12 trips to that market that wow. year. Um, and I was I was investing in other markets too. So I, at the time, I wasn't quite sure what angle we were going to take, whether it was going to be, you know, focus on three different markets and whatever deal pops up, go with it. Or, and eventually I got to the point where I really needed to hone in and target on one market to be able to really feel like I could learn it very well and network with all the local, you know, contacts, brokers and whatnot in that area. Um, 
but, uh, but yeah, so that's, that, that took about eight months to find the first deal and go under contract and then another four to close and then another, uh, four to get it stabilized. See, and that's not what everybody shares that you went there 10 to 11 times and it took eight months and it still took four months and it still took like, that's not what people talk about. It's not like it was 160 unit. This was 36 units, but but once you did get it, did y'all, did you, did you partner up with people on that deal or did you, did you, did you close it down yourself? No, we uh, basically did a joint venture. So a JV okay. structure where it's a small group of partners coming together and everybody doing, you know, equal work on it and um, contributing to the asset and getting it up and running again, basically. What would you suggest? You know, there's a lot of talk out there on, you know, if you're going to go, you know, if you're going to do multifamily, you're going to get up above 20 or 30, you might as well go 60 or 80 or a hundred to get a professional unit. That 36 is kind of a number that you don't see all the time. Were you, were you able financially to have a, a, a full-time property management on that? Like, was that kind of number a weird number or how did that work? Cause that's yeah. not something you hear all the time. Yeah, it is kind of an odd number. And honestly, we feel like it's it, for right now, it's a strategy we're, we're going with just because, um, we kind of fly under the radar of the larger properties and larger investors um, that mm-hmm. really only focus on a hundred plus units. So we feel like there's not quite as many people out there hunting for the size of asset. And you're also eliminating those people that are looking for the smaller stuff. So like mm-hmm. your four units, six units, you know, maybe like a 10 or 12, if it's someone closing with a partner usually. Um, so we're kind of in the middle of that, that search spot that a lot of people go for. Um and, and so, you know, we've found that to be beneficial. The, the bad side of that is it can be harder to find good management in that size range. It seems like the good managers are either single family or, um, you know, large, large, uh, large companies that are doing like a hundred plus, you know, unit count. Um, mm-hmm. So it can be a little challenging to find a really solid manager in that unit size that specializes in that, in that unit size. So um, yeah, that, that can be a little bit of a challenge, yeah. but yeah, we didn't, we didn't have any, uh, we had, existing management that uh, was referred to us from someone in the area that we put in place at this property and it's worked out really well. We haven't had to change managers at all. That's great. And then have you, have you bought more assets from, from then in, in other markets or the same market? No. So, um, so we got that one stabilized early in 2020 and um, right when we, we had been offering on several properties in spring of 2020 and then COVID hit. And, um, for all our small group, we, we kind of pulled back a little bit, hit the break on acquisitions for 2020, just Mm -hmm. not quite sure, you know, what the market's going to be doing out there, um, for a heavy value add or renovation project. Um, it was making us a little nervous too, that materials were starting to come in really short supply and get very expensive. And so, Mm -hmm. um, you know, those two things. And, and then for myself, I, I've, kind of been uh the one that is i focus on acquisitions i love the acquisitions process and getting to know you know the brokers and sellers and property managers in the local area and and finding those deals um and my time was severely limited in in 2020 as well um with uh nate and i starting our financial services company and um so yeah all that said and done we really didn't start ramping up the search until like the end of um end of 2020 just this last year um, so we're actively offering on properties. We put in probably mm, half a dozen to a dozen LOIs um, since the beginning of the year. It's so not a huge amount. Um, we are working on getting the deal flow up a little bit, but um, it's it's not my full time pursuit. My full time pursuit is is working our financial services company with Nate now. And so um, you know all that kind of to culminate when we we want to we want to uh, move forward on the right deal. You know, we don't really want to be looking for a good deal or a decent deal. We want to find great deals to invest in. So um, you, you just you literally took the words out of my mouth because uh, something I beg my coaching clients is how about you fully execute on the deals that you currently have before you're out there searching for more stuff? I feel like there's almost like a deal junkie kind of point of view. And it's like, 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 let's see these through, let's execute. Because if you have that job, right. And you, you have that way to make money. You're, you're good. We don't, we don't know what's going to happen, right. There's no foreclosures. We don't like, you know, and so like, I know, we all know on the other side of this, there's going to be tons of stuff. And are there deals out there? Of course. 
I mean, yeah. I we just bought one yesterday, but that's because nobody wants to deal with it. And I just happen to live close by. Like, it's not like it's like some like rare thing, you know, because mm-hmm. he found the right buyer. If he would have looked 10 other times, he would, nobody would have bought it. But I grew yeah. up, you know, I grew up there. Yeah. So what I would I'm also, in, go ahead. I would say I would, I would also add to just the principle of following up and, you know, staying on top of those, those potentials that maybe don't work out. So that's been a, a large part of what I focus mm-hmm. on is, you know, any offers or LOIs we made, you know, to keep following up with them. The the property that we did close on in 2020 or 2019, it took four months of follow-up with the seller mm-hmm. before we ultimately went under contract. Um, we did almost go under contract last week on a 30 unit that would have been a seller financing type setup. And it, it slipped out from under us, uh, another buyer had come in and whatnot, but you know, that's not to say it's, it may not successfully close. So staying in good graces with the seller, the broker, whoever bought you, you know, the deal, um, continually stay in contact with them. You never know. And, um, people want to do business with people they know, like, and trust. And the more that you can kind of maintain that, that perception with them is, Hey, you know, me, you can trust me you know, hopefully you like me, like anything you can kind of help to do to contribute to that. And in the industry, overall real estate, I just feel like it's fairly rare to find people that truly stick to their word 100% of the time. And so, you know, when you find somebody that can, I, I experienced that a lot in residential, um, not to bag on the industry, but I just feel like there's a lot of like, kind of two facedness or in business, business overall, I guess that can be, you know, a, a prevailing um, factor. But um yeah, the more you can just be somebody of integrity, stick to your word, you're you're going to stand out. So, hundred percent. And to to piggyback on that, I've heard of companies, especially acquisition guys and wholesalers, that are calling on lists from 2017 and 18 right now. Yeah. So talk about going back, you know, and understanding that we're in a, you know, I mean, dude, I could show you the numbers right here in Austin, Texas. You know, houses are going for 200K over asking with no, you know, contingencies. And um, I talked to one of this one of my coaching clients today, a home in Modesto had 177 offers on it. Holy smokes. Wow. Modesto, California? Uh, yes. Wow. And, wow. and I'm like, hey, glad I'm not that agent. What? <laughs> What? So that's why, and that's for, that's for an offline conversation, <laughs> but that's why we're getting into the construction space across America and yep. doing, doing offsite building where we can build a single family home in 22 to 30 days. Nice. Wow. And awesome. we can build small multifamily in 40 days, 50 nice. days, 60 days. Because if you look at the market and you look at it, okay, where do we go? Right. Because I mean, there's <laughs> apparently if multifamily is the new darling and everybody wants to be in the game. When everybody does that, I want to go the other way. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's so amazing that you have what you have in the, in the multifamily space or excuse me, in the financial services space, because that's never going to go away. You, yep. You've created a job that regardless of the market. And, and the only thing that, that I could say, if I had to rail against real estate is it's so peak and valley and it's so mm-hmm. peak and valley. And more importantly, you've also created a job for yourself, no matter what you do. I, I don't yeah. care who you are. I don't care how many VAs you have. You still got to pay attention a little bit. Cause if you keep your eye off the ball, they're going to spend money. They shouldn't be spending. Yep. And, that and so, huge, yeah. yeah, that was a huge point that we were looking for was we wanted a symbiotic business that was in line with doing the real estate investing. But we also wanted something that was in an industry that was, bulletproof almost and that this was one industry that we found that was as bulletproof as you can get it's you know uh, whether it's been a good market or a bad market recession non-recession pandemic um we had the best year in company history last year through the pandemic and so um and then also you know right now we're in we're in one of the biggest wealth transfers in the history of the world about 68 trillion dollars it's about to get transferred and being in an industry that you know we're able to service those clients um makes a huge opportunity as well. So that was yeah. a big thing that we were looking for is being in an uh, industry like that. One of my best friends actually works for the company that y'all do. Nice. And down in down in Houston, and he is destroying it right now. I'm yeah. so happy for him. He's about to have a baby. So, nice. you know, it's, it's fun. It's fun to watch people find something. Yep. Like I've known him like most of my life and he's always been searching nice. and he's found his thing. And man, he's just like out of a cannon. I've never seen anything like it. I, it's awesome, man. You know, it's like great to see. 
But then I want to talk about the most important thing of this. So you, you mentioned that you like to help couples uh, figure out how to work together. And here we go. That's because that's an interesting dynamic. I've yeah. played that game before. I didn't last. She killed me. So this is why I'm here out on my singleness now. <laughs> I'm not single, but I, I'm not married anymore. Yeah. And it's hard, guys. Let's not let's not BS about it. It's hard. But what I love about y'all, and I can tell, is that you were like, she does the apartments. It's not that you don't know the apartments. It's like, that's just, you know, what I find is that what I've always been told is that you can have your individual lives as a couple and your dreams and goals, but you can also have a life together. Mm-hmm. And so like, as long as you're like, I, I love my mentors who are in GoBundance because they're full dads and full husbands. Like that's, I don't care about how much money they make. Right. Yeah. Like that's what matters to me. Mm-hmm. And he, they've taught me a lot about checking in with your partner. Right. Yeah. And, and understanding that like maybe one is taking care of the kids and the other ones out here doing and whatever that is, the man or the woman, but just checking in and making sure that on a monthly basis that our goals are aligned. And so, you know, what tips do you have out there for, for couples or married couples that y'all found in your own working relationship? That's, that keeps it uh, so positive. Yeah. So one of the biggest things that we did early on is and it took a few years to figure this out. I've always been a big, big dreamer type type individual. I've always had big goals and big ideas um, and for the longest time, you know, Bethany was not, she was always supportive, but it took a little while to figure out what motivated her versus what motivated me. And mm-hmm. so, um, I was always big into like the Grant Cardones and, you know, people like that. And I was always kind of reading those types of books and getting around those types of people. And so, and she wasn't as attracted to that flashiness and that, that bigness. So, um, it took a while to kind of, but the key was, I just asked the right questions. I finally got to the point. I was like, if you could do anything, money wasn't an issue. Mm-hmm. Like what, what would you spend your time doing? And eventually she started thinking bigger about that. She realized what the different areas that are important to her. Once we figured that out, you know, the end, and the end result was we need more money to be able to do that. And so what are the vehicles that we can get, get in line with to be able to work together on, to be able to get to that point? You know, what she decides to do, well, she wants to put, you know, her efforts towards versus what I would put my efforts towards are slightly different. A lot of it are, are similar, but we had to find, you know, we had slightly different goals, but we got on the same tracks to get to those, to get uh, to those goals. Yes. Um, and that took, you know, it took a little while to get, to get that figured out. We figured that out probably, I don't know, three or four years ago is when we really started um, getting those in line. And then from there, um, yeah, it's just been, you know, one of the things that we do, on a, we try to do on a regular basis, but once a quarter is just kind of step out of our working environment or business environment, mm-hmm. get away for a day or two and just be like, okay, let's reset. Let's talk about our goals, make sure we're on track. What's important to us. Are we, are we keeping our priorities in line and things like that? So, um, that's always really important for us. And then, you know, date nights once a week, we try to do that, um, as mm-hmm. often as possible and as things like that. So communication is important. I would say the biggest thing for, for me, that's made a very practical difference in how we relate to each other is like a, a gracious honesty, you know, and so, or a kind honesty. And so the more that you can have really honest conversations or like, Hey, just to let you know what you said or how you said it, you know, fill in the blank it made me feel like X, Y, Z, you know, is that what you intended? Cause I don't think so, but just, just ke- changing, tweaking your communication a little bit where you're giving the, your partner the benefit of the doubt and maybe expecting the best of them. Cause I think um, a lot of times from the female's perspective, we, we read a lot into their behavior, like, Oh, he didn't mm. do this because X, Y, Z. And then we get all hot and bothered and mad about it. And then we, you know, hold a grudge and maybe don't communicate. Yeah. And then the guys are like, what did I do? You know? Um, and so, uh, the more that I've, cause I, I come, I used to be very passive aggressive and just be like, why doesn't he, you know, figure this out or whatnot. And the more that I've been able to, uh, communicate that, you know, Hey, this felt like that. Is that what you intended? 99% of the time, that's not at all what he intended, you know? And so, um, you know, just customizing your communication a little bit, you're giving the partner the benefit of the, of the doubt. You're believing the best of them and and having an honest conversation because that's important. You need to be honest and, and make things come to light, you know, bring things up that are bothering you or, or you know, especially in business because our time frames are a little shorter. We've had to get really good at, at communicating effectively in a short amount of time, you know, where it's like five minutes to a team training or something and we need to like 
<laughs> communicate about something like, mm-hmm. Hey, you know, can we focus on this for a second? Let's tweak this, you know, going forward. But, um, you know, that's, that's, that's been a, a, a real game changer, I think, and in, in how we relate to each other. And we as men, like, so on Mondays, Monday's my long day because I do coaching and some other stuff. So, like, I have Zoom calls from 6 a.m. to 9 o'clock tonight, so all day. Like, it's hard to handle me today because I'm in, like, full-on work mode. And, like, by, like, Wednesday afternoon, I start, like, I try at least. I'm dialing it back because I I front-load my weeks. And then I I leave, like, Fridays kind of or whatever, and Thursdays, like, we're – you know, other stuff. And so I've just kind of made that known that like, I'm, I'm, I'm running in like a Mack truck today, you know, maybe, <laughs> uh, you know, and it's like, but we as men like think that that's, we think that that's assumed. Like, I think that's what the biggest issue with men is like, well, it's like, you don't see me working here. Like, you know, and it's like, you, no, no, like a little more communication, like, we'll, you know, we'll take some, some Tony Robbins. Maybe we just need to have whiteboards around the whole house and be like, you know, Yellow, green light, red light today. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, but but no, I love that because you're you're 100 correct. Is just is just having that communication with your partner and allowing them to have the grace, but be honest with them. And like it, we as a human society in general, yeah. I think take everything way too damn serious. I think For that's sure. that's one of the bigger issues that I'm harping on right now yeah. is that we as adults are just so hurt by everything. And it's like, yeah. dude, that like his brain's probably especially knowing mine and I know the way you think, my brain's on, you know, I run like three businesses and like this two and the podcast. My brain's on like 70 different things. That's not like I I'm sorry, like but it's yeah. you know, this is the way I like to dream big. So we got to yeah. have those people that hold us down on earth. Cause we'll just fly off. Right. Nate. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's another big thing. I think that we figured out too was work. What are our strengths? Like, so mm-hmm. I'm the big dreamer. I'm a big, I kind of like to be out in the public a little bit more talking to people, that sort of thing. And whereas Bethany is a much more of an integrator. So she's the one that said that, you know, kind of has to, has to pull me back a little bit. Okay. Let's figure out how do we how do we integrate this, this big idea. Um, yes. She'll tell and you execute. And, and execute, execute on the plan. Um, <laughs> I've, I've pushed her into a lot of things that I had big ideas about. Well, multifamily was largely my idea that I just pushed her. I'm like, hey, you should, we should do this. We should do this. We should do this. And then I was like, you should quit your job and do this. And then she did this. And then I went and deployed for four months. Yeah, it's basically, here's a book on syndication. <laughs> Read it. I'm out. Peace. And then I come back. I'm like, sweet. All right. This, this <laughs> Are we doing this? Yeah. This way is being executed. On to the next one. Dude. Um, my, my, I went and visited my mentor out, one of my mentors out in Phoenix. And he said, here's the rule with you. He's like, when you come up with an idea, you got to hold on to it for 72 hours and not tell anybody. And he's like, he's like, if you still like it in 72 hours, then you can share it with somebody. Cause yeah. I'm just like, they're like all day long, just ideas are coming up. So now I've, I've reined that in a lot. Thank God. But, uh, and surrounded myself with, thank God, the book rocket fuel and surrounded okay. myself with a lot of integrators. You basically have a rocket fuel marriage, if I, if yeah. I may say so myself. So yeah. might be some branding in that. <laughs> there you go. I, there you go right there. So listen, guys, if people want to find out about all the great stuff you're doing, your content, the books that you have, everything, how do they do that? And one stop shop, your cashflow couple.com. Um, you could go there, get, learn more about us and links to social media and everything's on there. So mm-hmm. just your cashflow couple.com. That'll be the best place to start. I love it. Guys, thank you so much for joining. I'm so glad we could do this. It's very nice to talk to you all for the first time. Um, yeah, you too, thank you so much. Yeah. And then one more time, you're based out of where? California, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're in Ventura, California. It's about an hour north of LA, halfway between LA and Santa Barbara. The well, coast. there you go. I, you know what? Malibu is like my favorite. So I guess I'll just have to cruise up the coast. So uh, I'll, right. inter- I'll introduce you to my buddy who trades off market apartments. So let's nice. do it. Yeah. I'd love to. Yeah. Well, guys, if you like this episode, make sure you send it out to your friends. And if you need us, we'll be in Ventura. All right. (laughs) Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on -on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.